Well, good morning. It is good to see you all here this morning. Thanks, Daniel and Dawn and Caden for leading us. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 this morning. uh, We are uh, really beginning to see, we're going to see a big shift in the book of Acts whenever this strange fellow named Saul, who we just briefly have heard of, uh, comes to know the Lord. But as you're flipping to Acts 9, a couple things I want to say that i uh, be praying for Luke. He is at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Richland, Missouri this morning, and he'll be there through Wednesday. Uh, so be lifting him up. Also, I want to say thank you to everybody who reached out uh, and told me that you're praying for my family this week uh, with the loss of my grandfather. Uh, and so I uh, do appreciate uh, y'all's reaching out. Uh, if you had the opportunity to meet Papa Ellis, then uh, his name is Ellis Riles, but many of you had opportunity to meet him. He was a delight to be around and be with, and he loved the Lord, and God gave him a merciful death. Uh, this a very gracious way to pass this, this week, sitting on the front porch, talking to my sister. One minute, the next, he was in glory. And so I pray, I thank God for, for grace and mercy uh, with Papa Ellis. But uh, anyway, so thank you for that. Tomorrow we will be having uh, his visitation and funeral at his home church, Parkview Baptist Church. And so if you'll lift us up there. So Acts chapter 9, as I said, we get into a really awesome, really transition, if you will. Uh, we've seen the gospel so far uh, be preached in Jerusalem uh, to Jerusalem Jews. Then we saw it began to go through the really the outskirt to the Hellenistic Jews, uh, uh, which is somebody who was a Jew but didn't live in Jerusalem. Uh, we saw the gospel go there. Then the past few weeks, we saw the gospel go to Judea, Samaria, and then through the, through the Ethiopian eunuch all the way to Africa, if you will. Well, this morning we get to get introduced, really not introduced, we get to know uh, about a guy named Saul. And so, uh, and it's really important for us uh, to get this and to understand this chapter and fall in love with this chapter because here we're speaking of a man who I would submit is probably the most important figure second to the Lord Jesus Christ, especially for us as uh, Gentile Christians, as people who uh, are, aren't Jewish that are a part of the church. Uh, the, the same man who wrote 13 Uh, maybe 14 of the New Testament books that we read. Uh, The man who the Holy Spirit used to write deep doctrines and all the one another's that we see throughout Scripture. The man who was called to give the gospel to the Gentiles. The man who would become known as Paul, an apostle and the great missionary, the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. It's important for us to see that There was this man who at one time wanted the witness of Jesus to be extinguished. And how did this happen? How, why was he that way? And what can make a man who hated something love it and want want to end something continue it? And so this morning we'll begin to see this this conversion of Saul and how that may apply to some of us is there may be somebody sitting under the sound of my voice this morning that this idea of being a follower of Jesus or a Christian is like, that's the last thing on my mind. Like, I don't even want to think about that. Like, yeah, that may be cool for somebody else, but I'll never see myself ever coming to faith in the Lord Jesus uh, because that's just not who I am. That's not what I believe. Or, or you may say, Justin, you don't know me. I've sinned so much that I can never do that. And I would say this, that this guy named Saul, who we will talk about more and more, I'm sure if you asked him before Acts chapter 9, he would have probably have said, there will never be a time that I'll place my faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, there will never be a time that I actually believe this thing that these people of the way that we see will talk about. Uh, and, and, and if you would have asked the church, probably, will this guy named Saul ever come to faith in Jesus? They probably said, no, that dude hates us. And he, he's sinful. Like he is, he's literally killing Christians. And so maybe you're sitting here this morning going, yeah, this Christian thing. I'm sure Paul was thinking the same thing before he was headed to Damascus. And so, anyway, if you're, if, if you're with us, uh, I want to give you really two big things that I don't have a lot of time. One of them I'll spend all my time on, but there are, there are two big things that happen in Acts chapter 9. The first one is the conversion of Saul. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning. But the second one is really uh, validation to Paul's apostleship, right? And so, uh, what we'll see is Paul will be called an apostle. 
And if you remember at the beginning of Acts chapter 1, uh, after Judas, you know, had, had committed suicide and he was no longer alive, that, that the apostles decided they needed to replace Judas and have a 12th apostle, right? Everybody with me? In Acts chapter 1, they gave really prerequisites of somebody who, were, who was to be an apostle. And it's verse 21, it says, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. And so the first prerequisite of somebody to become an apostle was it was somebody that Jesus called. Right, so they're talking about the twelve apostles. So, uh, and or uh, somebody, somebody, Christ had called to them. Right, and the second one was uh, verse twenty-two, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. One of these men must become become with us a witness to his resurrection. So the two prerequisites of becoming an apostle was called by Christ and a witness to the resurrection. A really, ultimately, has seen the resurrected Christ. Everybody with me? All right, so we see this shifting because later on, the apostleship of Paul will come into question. Uh, who gives him the authority? How, is he, how does he have the authority that Peter and John did? Because he wasn't a disciple. He wasn't there. So what we see here in, in Acts 22 and Acts 26, that Paul does see the resurrected Jesus, and he's called by Jesus to be an apostle. So that's just kind of a, a side note that we need to understand as the book of Acts unfolds. How does he become an apostle? Well, the same way the other ones did by a call of the Lord Jesus, and he's a witness to the resurrected Christ. So that's just kind of a, a side nugget there if you're interested in just the deeper thing, like that kind of thing. But the main thing that we see is Saul's conversion. Now let's read Acts chapter 9 beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We pray now as our eyes and our ears, our attention is turned towards your word. God, you'll speak that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear your truth and see the gospel at work here. God, we thank you for stories such as this, that you save men who, to the human eye, would be beyond saving. That your grace isn't, that where grace abounded, grace abounded all the more. God, that we see it here in the life of Saul. God, I pray that you use it uh, to maybe even today to draw someone who is dead to make them alive. That you will use it to save someone who has not trusted in the Lord Jesus yet, even this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. So if you notice, I stopped at verse 9, where Saul's conversion story really goes to verse 19. And that's for your benefit. I stopped it at 9, and my notes only go to 9 because I really... Originally, I wanted to preach all of them. I went, better not today. Uh, so let's just stop it at nine. And so this will be a story that we start today and we'll finish up next week. Like I said, that's mainly for your benefit that we get out of here and, uh, before dinner. And so notice I meant dinner, not lunch, like before, because we could be here that long. Uh, but anyway, so who is this Saul, guys? So there's really uh, three things that I want to do. I want to teach this passage kind of like we did Ruth a couple summers or a couple whenever we did Ruth, however long ago that was, uh, to where we're going to kind of go through the narrative. Then after we go through the narrative, I want to pull out some gospel truths of this, of this text. And so, first of all, we need to answer this question because I know for, for some people we say, yeah, I know who Saul is. He became Paul and things like that. For some of you, you don't know who Saul is at all or who Paul is. And so we need to get a definition of who is this Saul guy? What makes him so important to the story? And what can we know about him? So a little bit of a little historical narrative, if you will, of 
of who Saul is. So refer, number one is who is Saul? Uh, we're first introduced to Saul uh, in chapter 7, verse 58. At the, at the stoning of Stephen, right? So Stephen in chapter 7 becomes the first Christian martyr. Uh, that he had been debating some, some leaders in Hellenist, Hellenistic synagogues. They couldn't overcome his wisdom. And so uh, what do they do when they can't defeat his wisdom? Is they just say, we'll kill him. Uh, and so what we see in 758 is that the, the people who had stoned Stephen, they laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So that's our first introduction to Saul, is that ultimately he was the one who many believe organized the stoning of Stephen, uh, so much so that they lay their garments as in his approval. And then we see him again in 8.1, and it says, and Saul approved of his execution. Verse 3, we see Saul again of chapter 8. But Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And so that's the first really three times we see the name of Saul. And it all has to do with Stephen being stoned or he himself making persecution. This persecution we've been talking about over the past month is the direct result of this guy's, his persecution, his desire to wipe out Christianity. Uh, in chapter 8, verse 3, when it says he was ravaging the church, literally means he was laying waste to the church. He was trying in his best effort to destroy this. And so some of you may be thinking, man, what could, what could cause a man to be that evil? And what could cause a man to be, have that much hatred or to be so blind? But the answer may surprise you. Because in essence, to the eyesight, Saul was not an evil man, if you will. What could cause him to have so much hatred that he would kill men and women? to drag them out of their homes? The answer is what he believed. That's the startling thing. And as I unpack, I hope that we'll begin to see in a little bit is, let me keep going. Saul was born in Tarsus, which is in Asia Minor. It's a very important city there at the time. It was really famous for its university. And so he was born in Tarsus, and he was a Jew, but he had a Roman citizenship. So he grew up a Jew, but he also grew up a Roman citizen. So he was like the pedigree of all pedigrees, if you will. Uh, he was a Pharisee like his father. Uh, at some point in his young teenage years, he want, they, his parents wanted him to be the best Pharisee he could be, so they sent him to study under the teaching of Gamaliel, which is literally what they said about Gamaliel was that he was, he was the beauty of the law. Like he was the best teacher. So what they were saying is the law is never at its most beautiful, beauty, beauty, prettiest, if you will, <clears throat> Then when Gamaliel is the one teaching it, like whenever the words come out of his mouth, you see the full, full picture of the law. And this is who Saul would have spent his time under as his disciple, the best of the best. He grew up, like I said, a Jew and a, as a Roman citizen. He, he studied under Gamaliel. He had the best training. He, like I said, he got shipped to Jerusalem. And at some point he comes back and he becomes one of the leaders inside the synagogues, the Hellenistic synagogues, there's a great chance that when Stephen was debating uh, in, in Acts chapter 7, uh, the, 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 those who were Hellenistic synagogues, that Saul could have been there, arguing away at Stephen and, and trying to debate him. He said he was the Hellenistic Jew, he's the leader of the synagogue. In Philippians, he says this about himself. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. It means from the very beginning, he's been checking off the boxes. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, I was from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the, one of the prestigious tribes. Like his pedigree speaks for itself. And he says, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as in I was the best Hebrew around, y'all. I had everything. 
As to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So why is he so frustrated? Why is he so hell bent, if you will, of destroying the church? Is because he was his whole his whole identity, his worldview was built up in this Pharisee idea of the law. And who was it? That the gospel first went to when, they, when, they, when it left the Jerusalem Jews, the Hellenistic Jews, which is where his sphere's influence was. So now you have this guy named Stephen and, and the, the apostles and now Philip stirring up all this stuff, talking about Jesus being resurrected, which they didn't, the Pharisees didn't even believe in. So why is he so frustrated? Because what was being taught was going against what he believed. So much so that he said, I'm going to wipe this whole thing out. In Acts chapter 26, when he's recounting his story to, to Agrippa, this is what he says in verse 9. It's going to come up on the screen. I should have marked it here. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. And I only locked up many saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest. But when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues. And I tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Here's this guy that his whole life was built on extinguishing this church, if you will. And here's the crazy thing. You ready? He believed he was doing God's work. So let's don't think about Saul. Obviously, he's sinful. He's no one is righteous. No, not one. But in his mind, he was doing the Lord's work. I wrote it like this. He was sincere, yet he was blind. I need you to think it like if you need to write something down to remember he was sincere, yet he was blind. We're going to come back to that. And then, so who was this Saul guy? The best of the best. The most sincere. And he was trying to wipe out something that went against what he believed. Not just get him to shut up, but ultimately he said to kill him. I want him off the face of the earth. So this is the Saul we're speaking of. So now you may understand at the beginning, <laughs> if you were to ask Saul before Acts chapter 9, if he would ever trust in the Lord Jesus, his answer probably would have said, by no way at all would I ever trust in Jesus. Some of you sitting in here this morning are going to watch us online later, maybe saying there's no way I'm ever going to trust in Jesus. Never say never. When grace interrupts your scene. And that's what we'll see. So who is Saul? So now let's look at Saul's plan. Let's go to the text. Uh, number, number two is Saul's plan. Let's look at what's going on. So it says, but Saul. So pause there for a moment. So this but connects it to what just happened, right? So what just happened previously, I know it's been two weeks, uh, but this is coming off the hills of whenever Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch in the desert. Uh, and then he gets teleported to Azotos, if you will. He finds himself there and he's preaching the gospel. It seems like all the good is going on. The gospel, people are getting saved. If there's party in heaven, if you will, because people are trusting in Jesus. But at that same time, as all of that's going on, what we see in verse one, it says, but Saul, he was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and he asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that he found any belonging to the way men or women, he might bring them and bound them to Jerusalem. So first thing he says, he was still breathing threats and murder. It's like the the stronger the flame of Christianity was going to feel, the more his anger and frustration began, the more his zeal to wipe it out, to extinguish that flame more, the more and more it would grow. And this idea where it says he's breathing threats, many of us may be thinking like breathing out, but the actual the original language is he was breathing in. As in this idea of persecuting the church was like him breathing in oxygen. It was the fuel in which he lived. The zeal in which he had is tied up in that terminology that he was, he was breathing in threats. That's what kept him going. That's what kept him. That was his purpose and mission in life was to wipe out the people of the way. 
we remember at the beginning of Acts, we talked about the high priest law. That's the highest held office in Jerusalem. That they were really the only people that were above them were Rome, if you will. And they, their job was to keep the status quo, if you will. And so what Saul would do is he would go to the high priest who obviously wanted Christianity to be snuffed out as well. And he would say, hey, can I have records? Can I have warrants, if you will, to get to evidently? They had heard word that there were Christians in Damascus. He said, and, and obviously we could put two and two together, that the Christians hadn't separated from the synagogues yet. And so Saul says, hey, can I have warrants to go down to Damascus, to go into the synagogue? And if anybody's there that's trusting in Jesus, that I can, I can bound them and bring them back to persecute them. That's, that's his plan. So Justin, duh, I could read that. You don't have to, I, I've got to earn my check. Let me at least tell you what the text says after you read it. So what he has to do now, his plan is to go to Damascus, and he does it, uh, and he wouldn't have been by himself. He would have had an entourage, if you will, or multiple police cars, if you will. He was going to take people captive, to take letters. And notice it says, anyone belonging to the way. It's really one of the only times we see the way there. Uh, some people say that was kind of like a derogatory mark for the Christians. Like, actually, the first time Christians are called Christians, you know, we like, yeah, we're Christians. That was a derogatory term, too, that we see later on. That it was these little Christ. Well, here it could be they're making fun of me. Yeah, here's the way, people of the way. Uh, but it's obviously marked by Christ saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so when we see that, that it's specifically talking about people who have trusted in Christ. So his plan is. He's breathing threats. Literally, that's what fuels his fire is to try to. He thinks it's his purpose and mission in life is to rid the world of this gospel and this Christianity. So much so that even the highest person in the land has given him permission to go to Damascus to pull out anybody who's trusting in Jesus. That's his plan. But number three, not only did he have a plan, but God had a plan. So what we see in verses 3 through 9, it says this. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Now, I love this. I love the terminology, the language that Luke uses. And so he is, he is hell-bent. He is, I'm so pumped about getting to Damascus. And as he was going, listen to me, he wasn't, he didn't have this moment where he was thinking about God. It wasn't something that he started correcting his steps. Then God did something. You follow me? It wasn't that he started going to church. And then by him going to church, that God's grace intervened. It was literally he was on his way to kill Christians, but God, as he was going, stopped him. You catch that? There was nothing that he was doing to earn God's attention or earn God's favor or God's grace. He was literally going to try to snuff out, wipe out Christianity. And Luke says, but on his way, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Later on, when when Paul is retelling the story, he actually says this is about noon. So whenever the sun is at its brightest, a light from heaven shone around to where it, it was brighter. Like when we get out of church, look up. Look up at the sun. I know I, you know, I never tell people don't like, look at the sun for a moment. What he's saying is that the light that was coming was brighter than even the noonday sun. He's on his way. He's almost there. As he approached suddenly a light, listen to me, we see this in his salvation, that it was sudden and it was unexpected. It wasn't something that he was conjuring up. It wasn't something he was contemplating. But that day, grace stopped him in his tracks. Suddenly, a light from heaven shone around him. Verse 4, and falling to the ground... He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There's a couple, there's a lot of things I want to say on that, but for time's sake, I'm only going to talk about two things. First of all, he says, Saul, Saul. So here, remember at the very beginning, there's this little innuendo that uh, it's validating the apostleship of Paul, of being called. And so this looks like a very Old Testament picture when God would call prophets. They would, he would say their name two times. He would commission them. He would call them. So even in this recounting of Paul's conversion, you see Christ saying, Paul or Saul, Saul. But he says this. He asked him a question. 
Why are you persecuting me? There are two things I want to think about here for a moment. It's a great truth for us to think about. Because in reality, Paul was persecuting men and women of the way. All right? But the question isn't, why are you persecuting the church? The question was, why are you persecuting me? Christ himself is asking Paul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So here's a great truth for us to think about. Hear these words. They, they reflect the inseparable link between Jesus and his body. I wrote it down like this. There is no blow struck on earth that goes unfelt in heaven by our sympathetic high priest. And somebody needs to be encouraged by that this morning, that the blows that the enemy, uh, our, our Savior, he, he, he feels those blows. He's connected with us. We are, un, we are in union with him. We are in him. And it's, it's so much so that whenever we hurt, he hurts. Whenever we're persecuted, he's persecuted. And that's a, there's a closeness, there's an inseparable link that we see. But that's not even the main point here. But here's the picture. What we understand in this text by this question that the Lord Jesus asked Saul is that Saul's sins weren't merely against others. They were against Jesus. Saul's greatest sin was the rejection of Christ. Because I'm going to get ahead of myself here because Stephen, or sorry, Paul, Saul, had already heard the gospel message. There's a great chance he debated it with Stephen inside of a synagogue. His issue wasn't a lack of information. But the information that he had chosen, he chose to, or the information he had heard, he had chosen to reject and to hate. And so what he's about to see is that his sin, yes, it's against those who have the way, but in turn, it's a rejection of Christ. It's a rejection of of Jesus. So like I said, Saul knew it. He heard it from Stephen. He heard about the miracles and the work of the apostles. Well, we're about to see at what one time he responded to in rejection. It was about to change that what we'll see is that God through Stephen, you know, I know Luke said this a couple weeks ago, but like Stephen is one of my favorite characters to preach on. I only got one week to do it. You're welcome. I just kept going. I wanted to stay there for a while too. But many people, you know, when Paul talks about that thorn in the flesh that he had, that he prayed for the Lord to get rid of. Some people say it was a health issue. Some people say different. Some people say it was actually the image of Stephen, him killing Stephen, that it was he couldn't. And, and what did Stephen pray for? You remember that? Father, ultimately forgive them of this sin. What we're seeing in Acts chapter nine is that answer to Stephen's prayer of the very one who was executing him. But so but he had heard it. He had, he had seen it. But what we see in hindsight is that through Stephen, through the stories of the apostles, and maybe he's even heard about Philip and the gospel being Samaria, is that God was laying the groundwork for this moment right here. Because what he had heard about Jesus, what he had denied about Jesus, is about to slap him right in the face. Verse 5. He says, who are you, Lord? Here, by the word he uses for Lord, I think we can understand that Saul already knew the answer to his question. Because it wasn't like, who are you, boss? Or who are you? It's, it's Lord and the covenant name Lord there. He knew, I think he knew who he was talking to. I think he knew who was talking to him. It's not hard to believe that he already knew the answer. And by faith or by fear, he asked, who are you? His worst fear was coming true as he was discovering, listen to me, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Christianity was true, and the gospel was God's truth. And here's the answer. Who are you, Lord? And what did he say? End of verse 5. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 
hey, listen to me, at that moment, his whole life collapses out from under him. Right, you follow, like he's, he's broken. He has no ground to stand anymore. The thing he built his life upon has just crushed down in front of him. Because this Jesus whom he's denied to be who Jesus says he was is actually alive in the one speaking to him. Who is this? It's Jesus whom you are persecuting. It was confirmed. The message he knew, the even debated against Stephen, this Jesus whom he thought was dead was actually alive and who he claimed to be. In Acts chapter 26, it's going to come up on the screen. This is whenever, again, whenever he is before Agrippa, he, he kind of expounds upon some things a little bit. Actually, this Acts 9 is literally like, has less information than all the other ones. But if you go to Acts chapter 26, Verse 14, this is what it says that Lord Jesus actually said to him. It says, and when all had, he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Ultimately, what Jesus was saying is what you're doing is futile and useless. What you're doing to find righteousness, it's like kicking against the goads. It is walking in circles. It is not going to produce for you what you think it should or could. You're wasting your time trying to do this. His soul was crushed. I wrote it like this. It's a futile work to try to extinguish the gospel and the church of Christ because all efforts will prove to be pointless and insufficient. How did this story start? By him trying to extinguish the church and the gospel. What does Jesus say? Hey, dude, that's like kicking against the goads. You cannot extinguish the fire of the gospel or the church. That should have got like an amen there, I thought. It's futile. So verse 6, in, the, in chapter 9, it says, but rise and enter the city. But if you were to go to, ch to chapter 22, again, it's going to come up on the screen. <clears throat> verse 10, this is Paul recounting his story at another time. Verse 10 says, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. So he has this encounter with grace in the person of Christ. He is crushed because his sin is against the resurrected Jesus. His life he's built up has been torn down. His worldview is completely flipped upside down. And what's his response? But what do you want me to do, Lord? The genuineness of his faith became evident in his surrender to the Lordship of Christ. In a moment, in an instant, his whole worldview was crushed. He probably didn't know. We know he don't know what was next. Matter of fact, when he leaves this, this scene, he can't even see literally much less where his life, his whole life was mapped out, figured out in a moment. In a moment, the whole thing crushed down. But by faith, he surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. He didn't have to know what was going to happen. Now, the Lord's going to reveal that to him through Ananias. But he didn't have to know, well, all right, if I do this, what does that mean to everywhere else? He just said, all right, Lord, you're the Lord Jesus. You're resurrected. You're reigning. What shall I do? I mean, that's the response of faith. You see, grace come in and faith says, all right, well, Lord, well, what shall I do? He submits the lordship of Christ. Jesus is Lord, I want you to know this, with or without a human response. It's not dependent upon if we respond to his lordship or not or how we do so. The question is whether we are submissive to his lordship or not. And whenever this, when we see conversion here, 
I know we don't have the Damascus Road experience, but there are things about this story that are true of all of our salvations. We were on our way, doing our thing, but God intervened. I realize he is who he says he is, and I am who he says I am. And the response in salvation is not, but I can, or I will. It is, Lord, what shall I do? And the scripture tells us to call upon the name of the Lord, and we shall be saved. It's all of our stories. Rather, yours was one of a drastic change like this or one that you grew up in church and little by little and eventually it just made sense what that was. It's not that you got smart. It's that the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to see Christ for who he was, see yourself for who you are, and he gave you the faith to trust in him and say, who, who am I, Lord, or what shall I do? Verse 8. So Saul arose from the ground, although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. You're talking about a whirlwind of a day. Hey, he got to Damascus, y'all. That's not the way he thought he'd get there. He couldn't see. He didn't eat. Later on, we'll see next week that he actually spent that time praying when God told Ananias to go. Can you imagine being Ananias, by the way? <laughs> and, and, and next week, I get ahead of myself, but God's going to tell Ananias, hey, there's this guy named Saul, and he's in Damascus. I need you to go see him. And Ananias, like most of us, like, hey, but you must not know who Saul is, God. Uh, <laughs> but it says he'll be praying, and so we know he went and spent his time in those three days praying, he's blind, broken, crushed, yet he was obedient. And he continued into Damascus and he waited. So what's our gospel truth this morning? What's our gospel truth? I know I've already, anyway, the first one is this. Is that salvation is by God's grace alone. Salvation is by God's grace alone. Here we have a guy on his way, on his way to do the very opposite thing of what God designed to do with all the zeal in the world. By God's grace alone, this man was converted. It wasn't his wit. It wasn't his idea. It wasn't him thinking, all right, I need to change my morals. It, it was literally in the heat and the height of his sinful and brokenness that grace intervened in his life. It was a gift of grace. Number two is that salvation involves a life-changing encounter with Christ. If Salvation for you or for me has anything to do with an experience, something we've done, something we recited, and Christ wasn't the mediator or Christ wasn't the object of that faith, then we're not saved, y'all. That salvation comes through an encounter with Jesus Christ because it is his. What did, what did they say earlier? That, that in Christ's name alone can man be saved. We've already read that in the book of Acts. There's no other name given in heaven and earth that what men may be saved. It is an encounter with Christ. It is Christ who changes lives, nothing else. It wasn't that. The Saul's like, you know what? I need to start thinking about what Stephen was done. The more he thought about what Stephen talked about, the more fuel to his fire to extinguish it. Number three, salvation involves a recognition of sin. Not only do I see the Lord Jesus, but I see my brokenness, my sinfulness. Saul, through the words of Lord Jesus himself, saw that he was literally persecuting the Messiah. 
Number next. I don't know a number. <laughs> Salvation involves surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. This is biblical salvation, not maybe Baptist salvation or traditional salvation, but biblical salvation. Listen to me. It includes a surrender to the lordship of Christ. Not I'm just going to have my savior so I don't have to go to hell. It's no I make a mess. I mean, here's this guy who had it all figured out and it couldn't be further from the way he needed to be. So his response was, all right, I thought I had to figure out, Lord, you tell me what to do. Go to the, I'll go there. I can't see anything, but I'm going to trust that that's going to happen. He He surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. It's a great analogy for us to see in the, in the gospel of Matthew. Right, we start in Matthew chapter 5 with the, the Sermon on the Mount, right? Everybody with me? The Beatitudes, blessed are the, and it goes all the way through to, you know, let your light shine, forgive people. You've heard murder, but murder is actually, if you, want your, if you think about somebody dying, you're actually guilty. Or adultery, like he takes it from the very act to the heart. So he goes through all this, you know, forgiving and loving your enemies and, and building your house upon a rock, right? So we see that Jesus. But then we get to Matthew chapter 9, and the first thing we see coming off the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus comes down and he literally hugs a leper. And for many of us, that's the Jesus we want. The one that hugs the leper, not the one of Matthew 5 through 8 that gets in my business. That tells me to die to myself. That tells me to have pure thoughts and a clean heart. The one that tells me to pursue righteousness, to, to, to live, the, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Listen to me. We don't get the God, Jesus of Matthew chapter 9 and not get the, the Jesus of Matthew 5 through 8. He's rather Lord of all or not at all. Can I pause here for a moment? No, I'm going to keep going. Salvation involves surrender to the lordship of Jesus. Number next is this, is that sincerity alone doesn't save. There was nobody more sincere about what he believed than Saul. Nobody. But he was sincere, yet he was blind. We have a school of thought in our culture that it doesn't matter what you believe, just be sincere about what you believe. Do good. Treat people nicely. You're going to be okay. Sincerity doesn't save. Christ saves. So maybe you're coming to church and you're sincere about coming to church. You wake up every morning. You can't wait to get coffee. You can't wait to shake some hands. Can't wait to go to small group on Wednesday. Those are all great things. But your sincerity for the things of God doesn't make you a child of God. Only Christ Jesus can do that. Number next is that any sin is first sin against God. That when we wrong or we sin against our brother or our sister or our wife or our husband, that sin is not just a sin against me and somebody else. That first of all, that is a sin against God himself. And we need to treat sin as that. You follow me? I'm speaking to myself here. That oftentimes I treat my sin, even as a believer, as if it's just something earthly. Like the only ramifications are those who are around me. But man, how much would I be quick to destroy my sin or hate my sin if I always thought about it? I'm not just sinning against Ashley. I'm sinning against the God who holds holds my life in his hands. It's a whole different ball game there. I can hide my sin from you, and you can hide your sin from me, but that government, we can't hide it from God, and every sin is first a sin against God. Lastly, man, I'm thankful for this one. Y'all ready? That God can save the worst of sinners. Paul says it like this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. He says, though formerly 
I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, insolent opponent, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners whom I am the foremost, but I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him. Pause for a moment. Why does Acts chapter 9 exist? So for me and you to believe in the Lord Jesus, so we can see the patience of God in the person of Paul, that today, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, that you will. That's why. And then he says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In God's timing, the same week that Papa Ellis passes away is the same week and I'm studying Acts chapter 9. So Justin, what's the big deal about that? You met Papa Ellis over the past 20 years. You met a completely different Papa Ellis that was, lived his life prior to that. When I was growing up, he was angry, violent, alcoholic, quiet, ticked off all the time. But by the grace of God, he didn't die that way. As I'm prepping to do his funeral tomorrow, Taking through stories and scriptures and things like that. I just studied Acts 9 all week. And here's what God gave me. If I learned anything from my Papa Ellis's life, it's to continue to preach the gospel because it can change the worst of people. It can make new people who are broken. He's an example of what grace can do. And this morning, church, may you be reminded of the depths and the lengths and the heights of the love of God that he has for you and his son. And what he's done to purchase our salvation that oftentimes we don't think twice about. I wasn't killing Christians. Listen, but you're sinful. And every sin at first, at first is a sin against God. But God, who is rich in mercy, he's made us alive in Christ Jesus. May we read Acts chapter 9 and go, thank God for grace. Maybe read it and understand that in just a few couple of verses that this is the very man that's going to be sent out to Gentiles. And he's going to fight for that call. There are going to be other Jewish Christians that go, no, no, no. And Paul's going to say, no, listen to me. God has called me to get the message to the Gentiles so they can, so they can see so that they could believe. So I'm thankful for Acts 9 that we see grace, but by Acts chapter 9, the gospel made it to us, y'all. Hey, if you're in here this morning, maybe you walked in going, I, I'm here. I'll never trust Jesus. Never say never because today you showed up at Cross Point Church on the day that the pastor would preach on Acts chapter 9 about a guy who wasn't seeking God at all, but a God who was seeking him. It's not, not my words at all, but you showed up on the day for you to see and you to hear 
that God, when he's ready to save, he he makes he interrupts. And he calls people to himself so much so that the only response is, Lord, what shall I do? And I believe for somebody in here today, whether you've been in church for a long time, this is your first day randomly, that today the God of the heaven through his word has shown the light in your life for you to trust in him. Will you do so? What shall we do, Lord? Good news is he didn't leave it to us to figure that out. He tells us in his word to believe in the name of our Lord Jesus, to trust in him. From, listen to me, from this chapter, we're going to get so many things that me and you read all the time, quote all the time, that God used out of this dude named Saul that eventually is going to tell us all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How could, how could Paul say that? Because he knew him and he called upon the name of the Lord and he got saved. This to me is, is beautiful. So this morning, if God's calling you if, you, if that light's shining metaphorically, if you will, if the Holy Spirit's stirring, will you trust in Jesus? Because no matter what your life has been, it doesn't have to end that way if you trust in Christ Jesus this morning. I'm going to be standing in the back. If you need me, come. Let's pray. Let's talk together. If you want to maybe feel more comfortable talking to a female, we can make that happen too. If you need to trust in Jesus this morning, please don't walk out of these doors until you're faithful and obedient. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for grace. God, thank you for Acts chapter 9. Just the first nine verses of Acts chapter 9. God, use them. Use them to edify your people. Use them to draw those who don't know you to yourself. Use them to light a fire for us to live confidently that any attempt to to extinguish your gospel in your church is futile. That if you're for us, that who can be against us? May it encourage us to live a life of boldness and urgency. Because the gates of hell won't prevail, you building your church. Maybe there's someone here struggling this morning. Maybe life has punched them right in the teeth. God, maybe life has them down. God, maybe they remember this morning. Maybe they encourage this morning that, that there is no pain felt here that's not felt in heaven that you sympathize with all of our weaknesses and you're good. You don't only sympathize with them, God, that you can minister to them. May we respond now in a way that glorifies